Welcome to this video on what you need to know about peer review. In this video, we'll be covering the process of peer review, the role of the individual reviewer in that process, as well as some of the most common areas covered in a typical review. We'll also take a look at how to give constructive feedback in a review and how to get involved in reviewing for academic journals. We'll begin with an introduction to what academic peer review actually is. Depending on your current level of involvement, you might have some idea already, but it's really important to understand the different approaches to peer review and how these can impact the general academic publishing process. So think back to the last time you purchased a physical object. Did you ever wonder what some of the little symbols and signs on the packaging or the item itself might mean? You might have noticed something like a kite mark, a CE symbol or the fair trade logo. And these signs and symbols are there so that the consumer knows that the item has met an appropriate set of standards. For example, the kite mark shows that an electrical item has passed the necessary safety tests so that you can be confident when you plug it in. Peer review aims to perform the same function for published academic research so that anyone reading it knows that it's been through some type of quality control process. It aims to independently verify the claims made in the research to ensure they stand up to scrutiny that the appropriate methods were used and that the conclusions reached are correct. This is an important part of the research process, as readers need to know that they can trust the material they're looking at. Academic research is not only used in other academic research, but as the basis for wider changes to society such as medical interventions, building technologies and government policy. You need to know that these developments are built on robust research especially in an era when it's easier than ever to share materials online. Peer review is also an important mechanism to improve research communication, as it looks at the work under review as a piece of writing and assesses whether it is clear and well-written. It's a vital part of improving the general scholarly conversation, especially when there is an increased emphasis on the wider communication of research outputs. It helps to ensure that authors understand the academic conventions of writing and are able to communicate the results of their work to a broader audience. As the name indicates, peer review is usually carried out by peers, experts in a particular field of work. They'll have an understanding of both the underlying research and its presentation. Authors should only have their manuscript under consideration for any one publisher or title at a single time and they'll often be asked to confirm this when they submit. The initial decision on the manuscript can go one of three different ways. It may get accepted without any changes, which is unlikely, but does happen. It may get desk rejected before it's even sent out for review. And this is often because it's not a good fit for that title, rather than any kind of judgment on the quality of the work. However, the most likely outcome is that it gets sent out to one or more reviewers for their comments. Although the model sounds simple, the current system is far from perfect and there are several issues that need to be addressed. The origins of the current system can be traced as far back as the 18th century and the model we use today goes back to the 1950s. So many argue that it's no longer suited to the publishing environment of the 21st century. Results of any review can be inconsistent because it's based on human judgment. Publications are individually reviewed by at least one and most likely multiple reviewers. The aim of this is to get a wide range of opinion and avoid giving any one person too much control. But as this system does rely heavily on human judgment, it can be unreliable and inconsistent with different reviewers reaching different conclusions. The current system delays publication of the final paper. A good peer review takes time to complete adding to an already extended publication time for academic research. This delays the final research output being shared with a wider audience where it could actually be of use. Some reviews can take months and in extreme cases, even years. And occasionally competing research is actually published whilst waiting for that particular paper to be reviewed, which is frustrating for the author. Fewer people are agreeing to review, which means that editors need to keep asking for volunteers again, increasing the wait time for publication. There are also risks around bias as a small pool of reviewers 
risks a smaller number of people having a lot of influence over what gets published. Although it's rare, there is the potential to abuse the system, to favour certain authors or even stop competing research being published at all. Perhaps the biggest problem with the current model is the lack of recognition or reward. Peer reviews are substantial pieces of work which are undertaken for free by academics as a way to give back to their discipline. This work is largely unrecognised and offers no tangible rewards in a competitive marketplace where academics face a growing list of extra pressures. There are many different models of peer review in operation and exactly which model a journal operates will depend on the publisher. A quick word here about terminology. It's common to see terms like blind or double blind being used because that was the historical term that was used. But this terminology is now outdated, so we're moving more towards talking about anonymized instead, but you may still see some of the old terminology. Under the single anonymized review system, both the editor and the reviewer know the identity of the author, but the author does not know the identity of the reviewer. This is one of the most established models and reviewer anonymity means that they can be free to be honest in their assessment, but may be able to use the identity of the author and build on their knowledge of the previous work. However, authors are not protected from any bias, conscious or unconscious, if reviewers know their identity. Some reviewers may see the name of an institution as a surrogate for the quality of the research, and therefore it may not come under proper scrutiny. Under double anonymized review, neither the author or the reviewer know the identity of the other, but the journal editor will know the identity of both. This helps to protect against any potential bias and still gives the reviewer the ability to be honest in their comments. However, there may still be some identifying elements in the paper, which means that the reviewer can guess who the author is, which may then result in bias. Some also argue that it benefits the reviewer to know who the author is so that they can make a more informed judgment. Triple anonymized review means the editor, author and reviewer all have their identity hidden from the others. An editorial office takes responsibility for facilitating the review process. This aims to ensure that the editor with the decision-making power is not influenced in any way by any of their own biases. But in practice, it's quite complex to administer, and it may still be possible to identify people from their work. Under the open model, all identities are known to all parties. This allows for a dialogue between all involved rather than a one-way judgment and helps to bring any potential biases to light. It also allows reviewers to get credit for the work they put into their reviews through recognition schemes. Some reviewers have been reluctant to use this model as they prefer their comments to be anonymous, especially when they're reviewing the work of senior colleagues or within small communities. Although others argue that it actually incentivizes a thorough review as the author will know who has written it. Transparent peer review operates in a similar way to open, but the content of the review is shared alongside the final publication. Some journals still use a form of anonymized peer review, but then publish the final named reviews at a later date. Not only does this build on the benefits of incentivizing reviewers and avoiding biases, as the reviewers will be named, but it helps to demystify the whole peer review process. People can see what's been said and it adds to the developmental history of the publication. It also allows others who might be new to reviewing to see what is typically covered in the review and builds up a bank of good peer review examples to ed educate early career researchers. We often talk about peer review as being a vital part of the scholarly research ecosystem, but what are they actually expected to do? At a basic level, they'll need to look at the output and assess its suitability for publication, but there are lots of different roles under this umbrella. They need to make sure that the standards, both of the particular title and the wider integrity of published research are met. Reviewers need to ensure that scientific standards are met, that there are no obvious biases, that appropriate methodology has been used, and that conclusions are sound and based on the actual research that's been undertaken. You're there to help the journal editor make an informed choice about what they should publish in that particular title. 
Reviewers can help to improve the standards of published research and increase the skills of their peers. Reviews themselves are an opportunity to provide constructive feedback on a piece of work to ensure that it's publishable. Part of this involves commenting on the science of the research and ensuring that everything is correct, but another part involves looking at it just as a piece of writing and offering a critique. This is a chance to help other, perhaps more junior researchers, to improve the standard of their work. They may not end up publishing with your title, but they can take the comments and improve their work, and this is a really valuable way of giving back to the profession, and something that is not often talked about when we're talking about peer review. Reviewers need to be professional when they're reviewing. This means compiling the review in a timely manner so that it doesn't hold up the wider sharing of the work. You should respond to requests to review as quickly as you can so that editors can move on to another person if necessary. If your circumstances change for something like a leave of absence, then you might want to let those you review for know in advance so that they can adjust their records. Part of this professionalism is knowing when to say no. Really good peers reviews take time to compile and you need to be able to devote that time to it. There'll be times in your career when you're just too busy to take on reviews. So don't be afraid to pass if you know you won't be able to do things properly. You should also keep things confidential during the review if this is the process that's being followed. Don't show papers to colleagues no matter how interesting they are. The author has submitted their work with the expectation of privacy, so this should be respected. Be honest about your level of expertise and areas of interest when reviewing, because this is how editors will match you with appropriate content to review. Only agree to review papers if you actually have the expertise necessary. Invitations to review usually include an abstract, which gives you an idea of whether or not you will be a suitable reviewer. It's the role of the reviewer to be constructive. The reviewer should be professional in their comments, never rude or judgmental. Always think, is this a helpful comment which would help the authors to improve their work or their approach? Constructive criticism is the key to good reviewing. You should never just say something is good or bad. Say why it might benefit from improvement and provide examples. Remember that behind every piece of work is the person who wrote it, so it's really important to maintain standards and be professional. Finally, it's your role as a reviewer to use it as a general learning experience for yourself. Learn about the process, attend training sessions or find a mentor or someone to speak to. Many publishers will now offer bespoke training sessions in a bid to recruit and educate reviewers. There's lots of content to dip into if you need a refresher and you should never be afraid to ask questions. Your role is also to learn about writing and improve your own outputs. Think about whether the author has approached something in a particularly interesting way, or whether you admire their writing style. This helps you yourself to realise what good writing and research looks like, and then can help you to develop your own skills. It's not usually the role of the reviewer to copy edit the work, for example, fixing spelling errors or adjusting references. You might be called upon to give general comments on the overall standard to indicate how much work might need to be done, but there are copy editors who do most of the actual editing. One of the most important roles of the peer reviewer is to be ethical and help uphold the standards of research. The review process needs to have integrity for the resulting research to have integrity. Most of the time there are no problems and everything is really straightforward. But when reviewing, you might occasionally come across things that just don't feel right, either with the output itself or with you as the reviewer. If you find any potential issues with what you've been asked to review, for example, potential plagiarism or perhaps slightly suspect reporting of results, then your journal will have a procedure which you can follow to report this in confidence. Try and find out what this is in advance of actually reviewing the article so that you're prepared if something does go wrong. Remember here that it's your job to report issues, not to take direct action to resolve them. If you have concerns about anything, you can have a confidential chat with your editor. They have the overall responsibility for the journal and you can always approach them just to talk things through before taking a more formal route. They might have some more information on an output, which can help you make a judgment about whether or not to take things further. 
You should never directly accuse anyone of anything without proof, but you might be able to suggest to your editor that there's something that should be looked into. Lots of reviewing forms have a space for confidential comments to the editor, or you can just contact them directly if you feel more comfortable doing it that way. There are also some issues for you as the reviewer to be aware of. If you have any conflicting interests, you should declare these when you're asked to review or as soon as you discover them. This includes things like knowing the author or working on a competing project. Editors are usually pretty good at spotting these things when they look for reviewers, but occasionally things can slip through. You should never ask authors to cite you or the work of your colleagues directly to increase their citations. You should only ever recommend that people cite particular work if it will help the paper, not because of ego or metrics. COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, have produced a really good set of ethical guidelines for peer reviewers that are worth reading through to get an overview of the different issues. Now we move on to the actual review itself. It's really important to stress at this point that each journal will have different guidelines and you should always follow local practice in your review. Before you start, it's important to make sure you understand the scope of the review you've been asked to do. For example, are you just reviewing a manuscript or are you expected to review accompanying materials such as data? This will help you to plan your time effectively. Read through everything you have been given at least once without making any comments or judgment. This will help you to get a feel for the paper and allow you to check that you have everything you need to complete your review. Depending on the publisher, there are usually three main elements to a review. A questionnaire form, a narrative report and confidential comments to the editor. In the questionnaire section, some will have a form with many questions to fill out, others will have a single box for comments. You can use these boxes and this form to record your thoughts about certain areas following prompts that are given, and then use these almost as a notes field to remind yourself of the key points for your review. Sometimes questions will have prompts to remind you exactly what it is that the journal is looking for in this area. Make sure you find out which parts of your review will go straight through to the authors to avoid any problems. The questionnaire section usually isn't visible to the authors, but you don't want to make any embarrassing mistakes. Your questionnaire answers should help you when it comes to writing your narrative report, which is perhaps the most important part of the review. This should be a continuous narrative piece, not just a copy and paste of your questionnaire answers. Use it to summarize your feedback. Highlight any major or minor issues that need to be addressed. Offer a summary of your opinion on the research and its suitability for publication in that particular title. Remember that it's always good to highlight positive points about the work as well as suggesting areas for improvement. For example, you could put something like, this paper was well written and engaging with a robust methodology, but the discussion section could be more in depth. A common question that we get about peer review is how much or how little people should write. This will depend on the journal and the individual output itself, but it's common to write at least a few paragraphs. Remember, the narrative is the section that the authors are most likely to see, and your goal here is to help them to improve their paper, so a couple of lines just saying that this is interesting really doesn't help them. As a result, the narrative report is the section of the review that is likely to take you the most time to complete. The editor will be able to see the rest of the report you've put together, whether they actually read it is another story. So if there is a space for editor comments, use this comments to the editor space to raise any particular issues directly with them, things they might need to be aware of, you can elaborate further on any of your previous comments in confidence if needed. In any type of anonymous review, you might include any comments in this confidential section that you've had to admit from the main review because it would identify you. Each journal is going to ask for different things in a review, but here are some of the most common areas you're likely to need to include or think about. Starting with the research question itself, 
Has the paper outlined its main objectives and has it actually answered the research question or questions that have been posed? Think about the methodology. Does the paper clearly explain the methods used, including why these choices were made in relation to this particular project? Are these methods appropriate to the research question that they're trying to answer? Look at the results and think about whether these are understandable and clearly presented. Are any accompanying charts, tables or graphs understandable and necessary? Have they just put things in for the sake of it? Think about the presentation of the paper. Does the title adequately outline the topic? Have they used the jokey title? Is this appropriate? That depends on the publication and the discipline. Does the abstract outline the main findings? And does the narrative of the paper make sense? So thinking there about things like the quality of language, whether it stands up as a piece of writing in its own right. It's important to consider the literature mentioned and any references included. You might want to comment on the breadth of the literature used, how well the author has conformed to the requested referencing style. Again, you're not here to correct individual references, but include a general comment if a lot of corrections will need to be made. Are there links drawn between theory and the outcomes of the research? Is the literature discussed up to date? Does that matter in this particular case? Or is it looking at something historical? Or is it looking at something very fast moving where you would expect them to look at the most up-to-date sources available? In the opinion section, editors will want to know your overall impressions of the paper. Is it something that people in that discipline need to know or that they're likely to be interested in? Is it sufficiently original? Does it bring a fresh perspective on an issue? It's important to be aware of cultural differences here. If you're reviewing for an international title, what might be considered old news in some countries might be developing areas in others. And there are arguments to be made for reporting on how innovations are implemented in different areas. Think about suggestions for improvement. How can the author improve this paper? This might be a separate section. You might cover it throughout different sections of your review. Remember to be constructive in your suggestions rather than just list things that are wrong. You might also want to mention the areas where the paper's done well. Authors tend to focus on the negative points, but it's a more balanced review if both good and bad points are considered. And then finally, you'll be asked to give a recommendation based on the outcome of your review. These are typically to accept with no changes, which is rare, but does happen. Ask for minor revisions, so small changes in things like content and flow and reporting. Major revisions, which might indicate a flaw in some element of the research, meaning that more work needs to be undertaken or that parts of the research need to be slightly rewritten or to reject the paper. Rejection, again, might not be because the paper is bad. It's not a judgment on the quality of the research itself necessarily, but perhaps because it's outside the scope of the title that it is aiming for. We've talked a lot about constructive criticism, and when reviewing, you need to keep this in mind because the idea is to help authors improve the paper for publication. But what actually is constructive criticism? It's essentially feedback which is designed to improve something. It offers comments that are clear, actionable and beneficial to the recipient rather than just a list of things they've done wrong. So you wouldn't, for example, write the literature review was poor, but you might phrase it as the literature review was thoroughly researched, contained the relevant materials for this topic, but it would perhaps benefit from a more joined up approach rather than just listing conflicting opinions. So you've identified an issue and you suggested a way for them to improve it. The exact comments that you'll make will obviously vary depending on the output, but we do have some of our top tips for giving good constructive criticism. Avoid making personal comments and always remember that there is an individual or individuals on the receiving end of these comments, a person that's probably spent a great deal of time and effort on their paper to get it to this point. It might be the first version you've read, it's probably the 10th version they've written. If you find a fault, 
or something that you disagree with, there are plenty of ways to share this respectfully. Think about how you would feel if someone said the comment you want to make about your work. Something that can help here is using I statements. So I think, I feel, because you are offering a personal opinion. And this helps to take the focus away from the author and their paper and helps to show that it is an opinion on what they might need to improve. Comments should be developmental. So offer suggestions as to how the author might make improvements. Remember that it's part of your responsibility as a reviewer to help the author to improve the standard of their publication. Be specific by including um, general comments on your impression of the paper, but also offering specific areas to improve. So the results section needs work is a typical comment that you might see. How does it need work? What would need to be done differently? How could they improve that section? And lastly, don't forget to include positive comments because especially if you like the way an author has approached something, this can be really nice for them to hear and it will encourage the continuation of useful behaviours in the author. So don't just say all the things they've done wrong. Say, actually, I think you approached this quite well or I really like the way you phrased this and hopefully they will continue to do that. Remember, as a reviewer, the authors may or may not choose to action your comments. Particularly if you're doing a, a second or even third, fourth review of a paper, you might see direct responses to comments from you or from other reviewers. Just because a reviewer has suggested something doesn't mean the author will have to do it. Obviously, any fundamental errors in the research should be corrected, but reviewer two has become something of a meme, a shorthand for people who suggest changes so the paper is more like what they would have written rather than what the author has written. It's important not to be reviewer two, except that the author has the right to carry out their own research. They're not there just to do the way the things the way that you would have done them if you were carrying out the research. It's really important to understand the distinction. You may see itemized comments, as you see on the screen there, or they may ignore them entirely in a second pass at the paper. It depends on the author. Now that we understand what peer review is and what's expected, how do you actually get involved in the process if you're not already? And how do you get credit for your work once you are? There's actually a general shortage of available peer reviewers, so most editors will welcome an application if you are interested in reviewing. It's important to identify your areas of expertise and your current interests. Consider all the areas where you could review, not just your main subject. And be honest about your areas of expertise and the level of knowledge that you have in these so that editors can assign the appropriate papers to you to review. Look out for calls to review or emails that come around on email lists. Think about the journal titles that you regularly read. These are likely to reflect your interests and your areas of expertise and be a good starting point if you're looking to review. You may find that you approach a particular title and then are actually asked to review for another title by the same publisher. That does sometimes happen. Approaching titles that you've already published in is also a good strategy. Tell them about your areas of knowledge, about your publication record, your current interests. You can change those over time as your research develops and the type of, type of material you would be open to reviewing. Look out for calls for reviewers from journals and publishers on social media, email lists. Does the publisher homepage perhaps have an option to register your interest to review? Make connections. If you're attending any academic conferences or events, this could be a really good opportunity to meet editors who might be actively looking for new reviewers. Talk to colleagues who review and ask if they can recommend you. Part of the work of an editorial board involves recruiting peer reviewers, so they should be able to help or pass on some information. If you know colleagues who review, ask if you can co-review with them, which is a really good way to get support as you learn how to review. And then don't forget to broadcast your interest. Make it clear that you're up for reviewing, that you're interested in it. Add badges and statements to your social media pages or your online profiles. And again, 
be clear about your areas of knowledge and what you would be willing to review. Increasingly, the previously hidden academic labour of review is facing calls for recognition. A good review takes time and effort and represents an intellectual output from its author. So why should you not get credit for that work? Traditionally, reviews have been undertaken as a way to give back to the academic community. But with the increasing pressure on academic jobs, people are asking why they can't give back and get some credit at the same time. Transparent peer review will allow you to be publicly named as a reviewer, but this might not fit in with either your goals or the format of the journal that you're working for. There are some schemes which allow you to claim credit for your work whilst allowing you to remain anonymous. You do this by registering and then you send your peer review submission email to the service, who will then use this to verify that you have done the review and add it to your profile. So you will then end up with a tally of Professor X has completed 27 reviews over the last few years. At the very least, you should add the journals you do review for to your online presence to advertise that fact to anyone who might be interested. We'll conclude with our final top tips for peer review. Always remember the human element to this. There's a person behind every paper. Be professional and constructive in your comments and think of the type of support you would like to receive if you were authoring a paper. Be that reviewer. Understanding your role as a reviewer is really important because it helps you to understand what's expected of you and to meet those expectations. Think about what the journal title recommends and how your review will contribute to the mission of that title. It's important to know your limits. Don't be afraid to say no if you're too busy to do a proper review. Everyone gets busy and circumstances can change, so always let editors know and turn down requests if you won't be able to do the review justice. Don't forget to publicise your reviewing. Depending on the model that you're using, you might be able to share your actual reviews, but at a minimum, it's a good idea to add the titles and topics you review for to your professional profile. This may involve a service such as Publons to en enhance your profile, but it can just be a mention. Peer review is an important intellectual output, so researchers need to be able to claim credit for it and showcase their work to the wider community. Thanks for listening.